really 13.6 let's see if I can do a fast copy paste oh no I certain they don't want to let me copy paste All right. you might be able to drag it out a little bit yeah but I'm gonna miss my find find and my I need a mouse to do this uh, so this is 13.6 Velocity and acceleration and polar coordinates is the oh, okay. basically the name that was already in your notes. Yeah. That's just 13.6. So now we're going to do, uh, we did multi dimensional outputs, so that was a curve. A curve took a T parameter, one dimensional input, and it had two or three dimensional output, depending on the problem we we're working on. What we're going to do now is have multiple input dimensions, and so to make it less tricky, we'll just do single dimensional outputs. So we'll look at multi multi dimensional inputs going to a single uh, going to R one. And let's make sure I have lines so I don't go to some crazy scale. So we'll have a definition first. So a real valued function, what that is referring to is the output. Um, so are we going to have, a, I guess, 13.6 homework? Or is it just going to be combined with 13.5? No, I'll figure it out. Oh. If it's not up now, don't worry about it for today. And then if I'm going to add it, I'll make sure I let you know. I won't just open it and not say anything. Oh. Uh, so real value function, any function. with range, range of f is a subset of r1. So the outputs are all real numbers. So that's the definition of a real valued function. So it's referring to the range, not the domain. So you have worked with real valued functions. The ones you worked with before had one dimensional input, one dimensional output. So pretty much every class before this one, you almost exclusively used real valued functions. What we're gonna do now, our domain of the function is now not going to be a subset of R1, it's going to be a subset of Rn. So our functions are going to go from Rn into R. So it's going to take n dimensions. So x1, x2, dot, 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 xn. And remember, if we don't know how many dimensions we have, I can't call them x, y, z, because I run out of letters at 3. So that's why we use x1, x2, x3, etc. This is going to get sent to some function f of all these variables. So let's do an easy example. this a little bit differently. So 
let f be any function from r2 into r. So if it's a function from r2 into r, it's going to take some xy pair, a point in two dimensions, and turn it into some single number. So let's do an easy example. So how about x squared plus y squared? That's pretty easy. All right, now what I'm gonna do to this function I want to think about points x, y, z, where I'm going to define z to be the output of the f function. So whatever that output was, I'm going to call that the z coordinate. And if we graph all these points, so if we think about this right here, x, y, f of x, y, So the graph of all points, I'll write in set notation, x comma y, f of x, y, such that x, y is in the domain of f. So if I think about all points that look like this in three dimensions, so what I did is I took a domain in two dimensions, and I basically, uh, this is called an injection, but I'm injecting that into a three-dimensional space, and the third coordinate, I'm using the output for the function f. So if you compress this to the xy plane, you would see basically the domain. And then the height will correspond to the function output. So the graph of all those points is what we call the surface of the function f. the surface over the x, y plane. So we'll look at this particular example that I'm just erasing so I have more space. So we'll look at this example. So if I wrote the surface out, so the surface is going to look like x comma y, x squared plus y squared. What is the domain of this function f? What x, y values could you not square and add together? Or is there any x, y values that you'd have trouble squaring and adding together? All real numbers. So it'd be all real x values and y values. So how can I write the domain down quickly? It's basically R2. So it's every point in R2 you can plug in. So there was no divided by zero, no square roots or, or even roots of negatives. And we also now need to be careful with inputs to logarithms. So we know log inputs have to be positive. So that's the third thing we have to look out for. Before it was just divided by zero and negative roots. Now we also have to look out for logarithms because we're in calculus three. So we just learned logarithms calc two. So occasionally logarithms are going to show up now.
So we're going to sketch the surface out. How do you graph something when you really have no idea what it looks like? Plot points. Plot points. Clueless method. So we could pick an x and a y value and square them, add them together. Or we could pick nice numbers that come from easy values. So either way. So I chose a relatively easy function f. What happens when x and y are 0? What do we get? Z equals, z equals 0. So that points the origin. So there's a one point we get. When z equals x squared plus y squared, can z be negative? No. Nope. So I've graphed the lowest point in terms of the z axis that this graph's going to have. So there's no points below this one. Let's think about z equals 1. So all points that satisfy this equation have a height or a z coordinate of 1. What type of x, y values solve this equation? Zero. Well, there's a lot of solutions, but is there a nice way to describe all x, y values that solve this? There we go, circle of radius 1. So it's the unit circle, but it's not the unit circle around the origin. It's the unit circle around the z-axis. What z-coordinate am I using? 1. 1. So it's the unit circle. It's not in the regular position, which would be around the origin on the xy plane, but it wraps around the z-axis at height 1. Wouldn't it only be a quarter of the unit circle because we can't move into negative x or negative y? Why can we not have negative x or y? Oh, sorry, never mind. <laughs> I was looking at so we cannot have negative z. Negative z. So there's no, like, the bottom part of this, I, I can't really draw the bottom, but the yeah. basement, let's say, has nothing in it. Okay. This is all, like, ground floor and above. So I'm going to mark one right here, and now I'm going to do my best to draw a unit circle. Uh, it'll be sort of cone-like. So that's, that's about as good as I can do on our circle right there. <coughs> now if you're looking directly down from the top, you're going to see a bullseye, basically you're going to see these radius, radii getting bigger. What is the next good z value? It's not 2. 4. So 4 is pretty good. You could use 2 if you want to. What type of an object are we looking at here? It's still a circle. Radius of 2 circle. So radius of 2. What is the height? 4. four. four. So height 4, radius 2. So that is 1, 2, 3, 4. So we're up here at 4. Now I'm going to try to do a radius 2. I'll just draw the circle twice as big as the last one I drew. So if we took a parabola, spun it around the z-axis, would that give us? Yes. It is a parabola. I think the word is paraboloid. Not 100% sure. I'm not a big vocabulary person, but I'm pretty sure this is called a paraboloid. So the reason it's not a cone, a cone would have had a radius 4 right now. Because a cone expands at a, it basically has a slope. This doesn't have a slope, this has a parabolic shape, not a, uh, linear. Not a linear or like a, tri it doesn't look like a triangle if you take a side view. So that's about as good as I can draw a radius 2 circle. And also connected to the origin? It, well, it's centered, no. at, it's centered at 0, 0, 4. So if I wrote the center, it would be where I wrote the 4. If I wrote the coordinates of the point, the point is really... Right, so it goes like inward? Inward. If, if I decrease my z coordinate, my circle gets smaller. 
until the smallest it can be is the origin, my radius is zero. And if I go below that, uh, there are no real values that give me negatives. So I can now come through and do my best. Oh, this is looking really bad. So I'm trying to wrap it in a, the way it actually looks is a uh, paraboloid. So kind of like a nose cone of a rocket, a little bit. It's an infinite nose cone, so it goes up forever, but it has a shape kind of like a nose cone of a rocket. Starts out not too steep, and then gets more and more steep as you go. Like an airplane nose? Yep, airplane nose, yeah. I'm not into aerodynamics, but it seems like this is a pretty good aerodynamic shape. The paraboloid certainly beats a box, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> I think it beats a, just a... I call it a capsule, but a circle on top of a cylinder. It kind of has a more gentle opening than a circle on top of a cylinder would have. But it would not be the cone. Yeah, a cone is probably pretty good. But again, I don't know much about aerodynamics, but this is probably a pretty good shape to use. I don't think it's a coincidence that airplane noses look very similar to this. So that is a paraboloid. So what we just drew are what we call level surfaces, or sorry, level curves on the surface. So we just drew level curves. So the way a level curve works, you pick a Z value. And let's say, we'll just call it Z naught. So you pick some Z value. And a level curve uh, is all points x comma y comma Z naught. And of course, Z naught is f of x, y. So I'm going to do something a little crazy. I am going to. Well, first of all, how do I move the function to the other side? Right. Inverse. Oh. Inverse. <laughs> <laughs> I looked at it. If it was multiplication, I would agree with you. Uh, but the way we move functions is we invert them. So I'm going to write something out. And then we'll think about why it doesn't make sense. And then we will make it make sense. All right. So even for this easy example we just looked at, What's, so I can find the inverse image of 0 is a single point. What is f inverse of 1? Looking at the graph. What points have an output? So f inverse of 1 is equal to, as a set, I need a little more room. I'll go over plus here. or minus 1 and plus or minus 1. It'll actually be a little bigger than that. So f inverse of 1. Is the problem that we lose information? The problem is your function is not 1 to 1 is the problem. So when I write down f inverse, f doesn't have an inverse in the usual sense. Uh, so f inverse, the way I'm going to define it is going to be all x and y such that if you f them, you get 1. So it'll be all inputs to the f function such that their outputs are 1. So the problem is we didn't have, this is a generalized inverse function. You can actually invert any function using this. The problem is what you're looking at is not a function. f inverse is not a function anymore. Because for each input, it can have lots of outputs. So now that you see this definition of f inverse, what is f inverse of 1? Is that more like the more true definition and the one we have before was kind of like uh, building us up to, to the true thing? Well, so the problem is what I just wrote down is not a function. Okay. So this is, it's the inverse, but it's not a function. So it's the inverse to f, but it's not an inverse function, because it's not a function. It's the correct word for it, it's a relation. It tells you how to relate some z values to x and y values. But what it, so let's think about on this picture right here, here's z equals 1. 
what type of points, what type of xy values are on the graph when z equals 1? When z equals 1, the xy values are the unit circle. So it's all the points in the unit circle. So the inverse of, f inverse of 1 is the unit circle. And let's go use some fun colors. So uh, at the top one, the one that is 4 is the unit circle multiplied by 4. So they're slider apart. Yep, that's f inverse of 4 right up there. And I could do f inverse of any number in between, and I just get that circle at whatever height that you're dealing with. So the problem is, like I said, this is not an inverse function. So f inverse of 4, if f was a function, it should give me a number or a single point. It shouldn't give me the set of points that make the circle. So this is an infinite valued inverse relation. Because even on the small, even on the unit circle, there's an infinite number of points. So this is very much not a function. Remember, all you have to do to fail to be a function, find one input that has either no outputs or more than one output. So right away, one already breaks it. So f inverse is not a function right there off of seeing that it's one. And not get and getting an infinite number of outputs. So level curves are inverse images of functions. So this is what level curves are. So basically, in this situation, we're picking a height and basically finding all points that are at that height. So level curves right here are all points x, y, so you pick a z naught and it's all points x, y, z naught such that uh, x and y uh, are in the inverse image of z naught. Maybe a better way, so you can use either one of these two, whichever one you want to use. Either uh, x and y values that satisfy f of x, y equals z naught or x, y values that are in the inverse image of f. You can think about either one, whatever works better for you. Uh, if I use that second notation, I could write it as, let's see. Now this looks like it's a two-dimensional point that I just wrote down. However, how many dimensions is the inverse of z naught? Two dimensions. So there's really two dimensions right here. So well, so there's th we're actually because we basically split up the dimensions somewhere up here. So f the function f has two inputs, two dimensional inputs, uh, and one dimensional output. So when I look at f inverse of anything, it's going to be in two dimensions. Does that make sense? So it's kind of, it's a way to break down a higher level of dimensions into, in this case, we broke down three dimensions into a one dimension and a two dimensions. Why is this useful? Or how is this useful? Uh, so I'll bet you do an example in a minute, okay. a practical example of this. This works if we use, instead of an x, we use a z, we could have... You could expand across any of the, any of the axes. Like could we expand across a function? You could expand across a different basis if you wanted to. So if you extend a local frame to the whole space, you would call it a basis. Okay. But that's very linear algebra E, algebra -y, and I don't want to get into that. Okay. Um, but you could choose a different basis which is basically taking a local frame and saying I'm going to use this, these three directions instead of the original x, y, z axis. So could you have a function with an ever-changing local frame like we were talking about in the last section and then do uh, whatever, whatever this is called that I can't remember right now. You overlap. probably don't want to use a local frame because you're going to want the same, for example, z coordinate to be the same everywhere like to be measured in an absolute way. 
Uh, so you could pick a different frame to start, but you'd want that frame to be the same for all the XYZ values. Okay, so what we could do is say have a snake the shape of the cosine function and then create a shell around that. You can't, it's just a lot of work because you have to basically figure out what my point is in my new coordinate system and then apply everything over there. So you'd have okay. to translate from your old coordinate system to your new coordinate system. Okay. And the generalized word for that is using an atlas. It's how to take one description of your coordinates into another description of your coordinates. Okay. But that gets really tricky. So we won't be doing that. But it can be done, absolutely. You basically go, you have to translate coordinates. Okay. Which you should have done in linear algebra. Although you probably did relatively easy ones where it was something like a rotation or a scale. It may not have felt easy, but what I'm saying is you probably didn't do some crazy thing where it, it was some um, uh, weird uh, function. It was probably a relatively easy function, like a rotation or a scale. So you probably did this a little bit in linear algebra, changing bases. Uh, but the function you're describing is not a, couldn't be defined with a matrix with constant coefficients. It You'd be multiplying by a matrix that changed coefficients depending on where you were in the space. Okay. And how? So instead of numbers, I would have. You could write it as a matrix, but the entries would be functions. Okay. Kind of like, we did this a tiny bit in the cosine sine rotation matrix. If we go back a little bit at the ends, uh, here's one example. It goes from two dimensions to two dimensions that rotates around theta. So here's a rotation matrix. Uh, in this example, you would pick a theta at the beginning. And so whatever your original frame was, well, two dimensions, so I can't use my thumb. But your, whatever your original dimensions uh, were, this one would be a rotated version of them. But you're picking your rotation at the beginning, so everything is rotated by that constant amount. Okay. Which is different than each point having some different rotation on it. Okay. That would be a lot more complicated. So you would have a, a another variable in here, basically. Okay. All right, so that's level curves. So hopefully you've seen a topographical map before. It basically has altitudes written out as curves. So I'm going to draw a side view of a mountain. This will be similar to Saddleback Mountain or any two mountains that are two peaks that are close by. So this is a side view. So this will look kind of like a camel. So. What I want to do now is draw a top view of the topography. So what I'm going to do here is I'll use blue and I'll pick the maximums. And now what I'm going to do is draw heights here. I'm trying to evenly space them. It won't be that every peak is perfectly um, the height you're choosing, but I'm kind of picking these on purpose. So the lines I drew are level curves based on different altitudes. So these are basically F inverse of different Z coordinates or different altitudes. So in this case, we have our Z axis going this way. And now when I draw this axis, this is basically the X and the Y axis together. Now, if you think, how in the world can you do that? I'll just say that line is two dimensions. So it's a two dimensional line right there that I drew. The symbol between the X and the Y looks like an eight. It's an ampersand. Ampersand. And ampersand. Uh, it's basically the cross product of them. So I guess I could write, if, well, it would look really bad if I wrote x cross y axis. It looks like it's the x, x, y axis, so I'm going to stick with the ampersand. 
All right, now I'm going to redraw a top view of what the topographical map will look like. So pretend that uh, the camera is basically moving up to here. So our new camera will be filming from the top now. So we'll be looking downwards. Now what you can't tell from the way I drew is how wide the mountain is. So you can kind of tell one direction, but you can't tell the direction that is going out of the board right here. So it might be a really wide, not steep mountain, or it might be a really narrow, steep mountain like they have in Hawaii. Or it might be more like a, I don't know. Dome that we were talking about. Earlier. Yeah, more gentle, like the mounds up in Grand Mound or something like that. Like they're not terribly steep. So we don't know. I can't, from this, I can't detect how steep that angle is from the, uh, like if you were walking towards it the way you're looking at it, how steep this would be. So now I'm going to do my best to redraw the level sets from a top view. So that'll be one peak. That will be the other peak. I'll just say they're lined up. Now the tall peak has a circle like that. It has a second circle probably a little smaller like that. And let's mark off some different heights. Yeah, yeah, if I was evenly spacing, I think that one should be moved up a tiny bit. All right, so I have my height six. Maybe these are like hundreds of feet or thousands of feet, depending on how big your mountain is. It doesn't really matter, but we got height six, height five. When height four hits, there's actually two different components that have an altitude of four. There is this ring over here and the top of the small mountain. So that's the inverse image of four now has two components. So any questions on that idea? Now we're going to go for the inverse image of three. So now there's the inverse image of three has two components. So I just highlight them there. There's one loop around the small peak and a loop around the tall peak. It's OK if your circles are not circles anymore, because mountains generally are not perfect um, cone-shaped objects. So <laughs> you are better off not having perfect circles here. <coughs> now the next one, the way I drew the next line, or the next curve, it still has two components. However, they're getting pretty close together. So it's still going to be two loops, but they're going to be pretty close together. I probably drew them a little too close already. So I'll just slide the left one over a tiny bit. Four, three. So now we're at the two, and these guys are supposed to be pretty close together. So here's my two. That two curve and the other two curve. What is the last level curve going to look like for one? It looks like on our topographical map that it is a single component. It's not split into two pieces. So it's going to go around both. And not go in between. And it won't, so it won't be cut off into two pieces. So it'll look like a headless snowman. So it'll, yeah, kind of look like a snowman or kind of like a figure eight. But what I don't know is how far in here it goes before it comes back out. So what I'm going to do is just go in a little bit and then back out. So I don't know exactly how far it goes in without more information. And then something similar happens over here and then goes out around like that. So that's the height one level set or level curve. And this is what topographic maps look like. So if you go to Google Maps or whatever program you use, you can 
look at sometimes it's called altitude or sometimes it's called topography you turn on the topography but this is similar to what you see this is uh, if there was two peaks close by all right so those are level sets right there now if you are actually trying to climb up or build a road you generally want to pick uh, let's see would be a bad path so this would probably not be the best one to pick because you're going to go up like a hundred or a thousand feet in a shorter period of time so if we were building a road to the top you'd probably want to choose somewhere closer to there to go so you're going up less steep you don't just go up I mean if you're building an elevator you can pick a steeper part but if you're trying to build a road you want to go on the least steep part possible generally so if we we're cl climbing to the top you would care you could carefully pick oh it looks like maybe if I go over here it's less steep and then over here and then it doesn't matter probably up the rest uh, now that being said you probably want a lot more information than this only tells you what's happening every hundred or thousand feet there's a lot of smaller detail. Maybe there's a huge cliff right here. <laughs> so you need a, probably want a lot more level set information if you're actually going to plot the best path to get up here. Plot the best path and take the average. 